Dear Father Simon and the Drive Time Clergy Collective, no points for originality there. I am writing to request forgiveness for an event that took place when I was young and foolish and living just outside Glasgow. It's June 1987 and we had just finished our exams. The mood was joyous. The sun was shining. We were all glad the pressure of the exams had finally come to an end. Basically, we all needed to blow off some steam. Let me first tell you, I was not the most popular boy at school. I wasn't the school sporty one. I wasn't the moody goth, as was popular at the time. Just an average guy who studied hard, was well behaved and did what he was told. Now, at this time, I did have a fancy for a certain girl who sat next to me in history. Caroline was very popular, very good looking and was chased by all the cool guys in the school and I fancied her something rotten. Well, during our history class, not much teaching going on as it was near the end of term. That's a wonderful feeling. We go to school, but all the work's done, so you're just dotting put, put around. Put on a DVD, something like something, that. Yeah. Something like that. There's always one teacher, though, who says, no, 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 you're going to have to do some work. But anyway, there wasn't much going on in this particular history class. So uh, she says, are you going to Sharky's Empty on Saturday? At this point, I should explain an empty is a West of Scotland term for when the parents are out and the house oh. is going mm. to be empty. Home alone. Therefore, a party had to be had. Sharky, I can tell you, was the coolest, most popular guy in the school, and he had a huge house. Anyway, I told Caroline, no, I wouldn't be going to Sharky's because I hadn't been properly invited, which is when she turns to Sharky and says, can Cy come to the empty on Saturday? He just shrugged and grunted. So Caroline turns to me and says, there you go, you're coming. I later told my friend Johnny, who was ecstatic, hey, we're going to an empty at Sharky's. Nice one. I <laughs> was nervous because I knew I was going to feel a little out of place, but Caroline was going to be there, so basically I just had to suck it up. Well, the Saturday came, and we turned up at Sharky's house to find the front door already open. We went in, and the house was jumping. People dancing on tables, a kitchen full of people being ill, <laughs> Great. Nice. Fabulous Girls already. crying in the toilet. Yeah. Just a usual teenage party, really. Mm. But this was my first empty, and it was amazing. So we went to the kitchen and opened out our carry-out, consisting of uh, two bottles of cider. Nice. They came prepared. I then spotted Caroline, and she came over and started being very friendly. Mm. Now, I know it was probably the lemonade talking, but she was being very touchy-feely, and I genuinely thought I was in here right up to the point until Sharky came over and snogged her right in front oh. of me and then led her away. Oh, well, dear. I knew it was oh. never to be anyway. But while I was cursing my luck, a fight broke out in the kitchen about someone opening someone else's cans. Oh, dear. And not wanting to get involved... This is the sentence that doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Johnny and I decided to go upstairs. <laughs> right. Really? Get okay. out of the way. Okay. Get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know that. What's wrong yeah. with the garden? Oh, I yes. suppose there yeah. were people being ill in the garden. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we opened a door looking for the loo. Oh, no. And found oh, it was no. the airing cupboard. Anyway, yeah. looking up, we saw a loft hatch. And naturally, me and Johnny decided to go and have a look. Obviously. Well, Father Simon, the loft was absolutely massive. Mm. Partially floored with cases, boxes and games, we started to have a good look round. We were messing about and trying stuff on. <laughs> because I... This has gone down a completely different route. <laughs> it has. No, no, because... No, I think me, though, as in clothes. Yeah. I found... No, no, a, yeah, I know, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I found a box of fur coats. <laughs> I got, what else? Anyway. Hats and even found a crazy bear costume, which I obviously put on. Obviously. So at one point, I found an accordion and started to try and play it. So there I was. <laughs> so there I was sitting in a loft with a bear costume and playing an accordion. We were so engrossed in all the paraphernalia in the loft, we hadn't noticed the music had stopped downstairs. Wondering why it had suddenly gone quiet, Johnny headed towards the skylight with a telescope that we'd found and <laughs> what is in this loft and stuck it out the window. He came back with a look of panic and said, "It's the Rosers." <laughs> He didn't. It's, it's the police. They're outside. He's in the west of Scotland. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have said that, would he? Ross. I looked, and sure enough, the street was full of teenagers and a police van with the blue lights flashing. Oh. I then saw a car pull into the drive. Turns out our neighbour had called the police due to the noise and managed to get in touch with Sharky's mum and dad, who'd come back from the golf club dance. 
We suddenly realized the gravity of our situation and decided we better try and tidy the loft. I then heard a voice shout, Is there someone in the loft? <laughs> Before the hatch suddenly <gasps> opened. I panicked and ran to the back of the loft while Johnny hid behind some boxes. However, in my panic, I forgot that the loft had only been partially floored. Oh, no. And the place I ran to was not floored. I felt my foot drop and I thought, oh, no. I, I, I'm going through here. <laughs> I went straight through the ceiling and landed on a bed, absolutely covered in plaster with bits of ceiling hitting me on the head. I stood up and turned round and there was Mrs. Sharkey standing in the middle of the bedroom about to get undressed. She looked more than a little shocked, it's fair to say, probably because a bear covered in plaster <laughs> and playing an accordion had just crashed See, through the ceiling still got the accordion. <laughs> into her room. <laughs> As Mrs. Sharkey started screaming, I turned and ran out of the room and down the stairs and then out the back door. I could hear Mr. Sharkey trying to climb down from the loft as fast as he could. <laughs> I ran out of the house. I kept going over the hedge at the back of the garden into another garden and beyond. The story of the bear that ran away from Sharkey's empty became legendary around our way, although no one ever discovered the identity of the bear. I never actually told anyone, even though I knew it would have made me more popular. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is true. Yeah. Father Simon, I seek forgiveness from Mrs. Sharkey for giving her the fright of her life and damaging her property. I also seek forgiveness from Johnny for running off and leaving him behind. I also seek forgiveness from Sharkey himself as he was grounded till the summer. However, he did steal Caroline from me. Mm. So, actually, which is the unforgivable thing. Well, yeah. So you can imagine that would be quite, you know, you're just getting undressed. You've been, you're a little bit cross because you've been dragged back from the golf uh, evening soiree. And then suddenly a bear playing accordion drops from the roof. That doesn't happen every day. Sister Bobby. I think I'm beyond caring. That's such mm. the best story mm. ever, yeah, ever, yeah, ever, yeah. Ever, ever, ever. Simon, I would almost marry you for that. Oh. Uh, you oh, yeah. What, what <laughs> I think was she the means point the again? other Simon. It's, oh. uh, yeah, not you. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh. all right. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> um, Simon, for the best story ever, and it, well, you shouldn't really go into people's laughs without their permission and everything, but it was the best story ever, and it's not usual, my, my usual remit, you are forgiven just for the best story ever. Uh, nine, oh, I'm exhausted. How many layers of a confession can you have? And who can't resist? I mean, a loft hatch has just got to be investigated, hasn't it? Particularly when you've had two bottles of cider split with your mate Johnny. How, but how, many, but how many lofts... Have have a big chest full of uh, clothes with a, an empty bear costume in yeah, there somewhere. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I've just cleared out a loft, and there is an accordion and a guitar and an amp and some. There wow. you go. Very Actually, we, yeah, we've got a, a loft with Halloween stuff oh, in it. Yeah. That comes out every oh, year. Oh, maybe you know, everyone's got go. one. Right. Silly me, uh, but also that was really fantastic. And what happened to Johnny? Who cares? Yes. <laughs> it abandoned his mate, fallen through the ceiling, given Mrs. Uh, Golf Club um, a bit of a surprise, and off he went. That's fantastic. Ab Simon, absolutely forgiven. Uh, well, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sharkey, I think, probably had this coming. I mean, you disappear off to the Golf Country Club and leave your house empty with your son, young Junior Sharkey. <laughs> this is always, always going to happen, uh, apart from, obviously, uh, an accordion playing bear falling through your ceiling. Probably didn't <laughs> expect that. That's fair enough. So I am going to forgive. Simon and the team. Let me take you back to the 25th of May, 1977. Uh-huh. When Liverpool FC yeah. qualified for their first European Cup final in the eternal city of Rome. Being a lifelong fan, I decided to book a, day's, a day flight to watch my team in this historic match against Borussia Mönchengladbach of Germany at the Olympic Stadium. I landed in Rome on the morning of the game and joined 25,000 other Reds who had made the arduous journey, many of them travelling overland by special train from Lime Street Station. As it was my first time in Rome, I decided, like many others, to visit the Vatican. Now, my nan was uh, back at home, and she's a devout Catholic and went to church every day, so I decided to buy her a nice set of Vatican rosary beads to take back to Liverpool, when in Rome and all that. As I was walking back out of the Vatican, I need to apologise, by the way, there is an accent. <laughs> there is an accent coming up, which is unavoidable because it is written in this style. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Great. So this is on, yes. either going to be Italian or Scouse. It As I, it's not, it's not going to be Scouse. <laughs> As I was walking back out of the Vatican, I spotted a priest standing in the main hall, and a thought struck me. Since I'm here, I might as well get the beads blessed for Nan while I'm in the Vatican, save for the trouble of doing it at our local church back in Liverpool. I approached the priest, held up the beads, and asked him very politely to bless them. Yeah, he says, 
I would very much like and be very happy to do this for you, he replied. It turns out he was from Dusseldorf. Ah, yes. Obviously, as you can tell. Yes, obviously. Yes. Yeah. And he was over for the big match, and he duly did a short prayer over my beads and blessed them. On handing them back, though, he said, I will not be praying for your team tonight, however... <laughs> oh, it's a French in the end. No, no, no. I will not be praying for your team tonight, he says, being a German priest. Yes. You sound like the vamp in Sesame Street. Good. Well, I'm, there are worse things to, to, to sound like. Anyway, he's a priest from Dusseldorf, and he did the honours there, as they say. That's a bit of uh, Catholic language. I, I, I smiled, thanked him, and thought no more of it, especially not after Liverpool won the game 3-1, and I was too busy celebrating anyway. I couldn't celebrate for too long, however, as I had to head back to Liverpool the same night. The next day, I told my dad the story, and he said something along the lines of, for heaven's sake, don't tell your nan they've been blessed by a German. She'll throw an absolute fit. Well, I promised my dad that I wouldn't say a word of that to nan and vowed there and then to keep the story to myself. Different time. Yeah. A few days later on Sunday morning, we all went round to Nan's after church as we did every Sunday. And because this day was also her birthday, all of my uncles, aunts and cousins were there too. In front of everybody, I very proudly presented my gift to her and she smiled, gave me a little peck on the cheek and placed the rosary beads around her neck. Nan then said, I'm going to mass later, so I'll ask the Monsignor to bless them for me. And this is where it all started to go wrong. And for some unknown reason, I blurted out, "It's no need, Nan, they've already been blessed. Now, I tried to stop my sentence halfway through, but you know what it's like? It's too late. It's already out. Oh, really? Who by? Oh, no. Says, oh, no. says Nan. And in a blind panic, I said the very first thing which came into my head. Yeah. Uh, they were blessed by the Holy Father himself. The Pope. <gasps> Great. Yeah, of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> the room fell silent. And my Nan, <laughs> who had by this time clasped the rosary beads firmly to her chest, stammered, You... You mean the Holy Father Pope Paul himself has touched these beads? Her face had turned white by now and she'd started to shake. The whole room by now was staring at me as if they knew I was telling Porkies. My dad was glaring at me through clenched teeth, which is my favourite <laughs> phrase. Yeah, doesn't work. Anyway. <laughs> it doesn't mean, you, gotta, <laughs> get the, you get the idea of what he was doing. But I had no choice to carry on and tough it out. Yes, Nan, I said. He was walking past the crowd outside the Vatican. I held them up to him asked him to bless them, and he took them off me and said Hail Mary and passed them back. Well, she started hyperventilating. It became clear we needed to calm her down, so we sent her for a lie down with a glass of sherry, which always works. When Nan recovered a little bit later, she promptly took off her pinny, put on her scarf, coat and brolly, then trundled off to her sisters around the corner in the pouring rain to show off her new souvenir to everyone who would listen. In fact, rumour has it that some women in the parochial club that evening actually fainted when my Nan regaled the story of the Holy Father and the Vatican Bees. And to compound my embarrassment, the Monsignor told the tale again from the pulpit at Mass the next week, Excellent. much to the displeasure of my dad, who kicked me in the ankle under the pew. <laughs> <laughs> he prefers that to the piece anyway. You should have seen his face when my nan got up and walked up and down the aisle to proudly show the beads off to the congregation, many of whom reached out just to touch the same beads. Following that, my dad stopped my pocket money for a month. <laughs> and he made, yeah. me, he made me put it into the church plate every Sunday as punishment. However, he never told my nan the truth. No one told my nan the truth. And she wore the beads every time she went to church for the rest of her life. And I'm sure it gave her great pleasure and great comfort. However, I do now belatedly beg forgiveness for misleading my lovely little nana, along with the Monsignor and half the parishioners of St. Dominic's in Heighton, Liverpool, uh, in the process. Well, you know, I, I, Alan didn't mean to... And it, from, it, it, from the sound of it, it sounds as though Alan's nan got a great lot of joy, f even though it was based on a deception. So maybe there are no victims. I don't know. Let's see what Sister Bobby thinks. Well, the thing is, is, of course, Alan, you did that lovely thing. You got a gift and you got it blessed. It's a double gift. That's really considerate of you. And actually, you're right. The deception wasn't yours. You didn't go out to deceive. And there is that, just that moment when she said, oh! 
And how could you possibly take Can't that away back. from your nan? There. And I think, surely, all blessings are the, of equal value. Surely, it doesn't really matter. Point. It's. I mean, I don't know these things. Maybe someone could put me right. But it's a blessing. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. And she got to say, so much joy from it. And how could you kind of mock her? You couldn't. There was no. The point was, in the living room, you'd have had to destroy her lovely bit of joy. And from that point on, you just had to go with it. You are forgiven, Alan. I think, given the circumstances, that was the best thing to do. And the last Pope, but one was German so it could actually have been him. Oh, yes. Could have been. Um, oh, yeah, well, obviously, everybody wins from this because Gran wins because uh, she gets a rosary that's uh, been blessed by the Pope. I mean, we don't know how this works, but I'm guessing, you know, if, it, if it's been blessed by a priest, then line of succession... Counts the same. Com ...command and control. It's sort of... It's the same thing, isn't it? Command it and control. Passed, yeah, it gets passed down to the, the bishops and the uh, deacons and I'm out of my depth. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to say, yes, I mean, that's fine. Uh, so, so she wins and... Uh, he wins, and Liverpool win 3-1, uh, as I seem to remember, on the yeah. way to winning four other European Cups. Oh, um, right. So, uh, everybody wins. Well done. Definitely forgiven. Father, so this confession takes me back to the start of my career. We're in the summer of 2002, and I'm 23. I was a fledgling journalist, desperate for a job, and had somehow managed to land an interview for a coveted role at a top news agency. I bought a smart black trouser suit, and I was confident I could do the job. The downside was that the company in question was located in a tiny village in the middle of East Yorkshire, and at that point I hadn't yet passed my driving test. Nevertheless, I set off in good time, caught the train. Unfortunately, the trains only ran what seemed like once every couple of days, and I found myself in the village an hour before my interview was due to start. No problem, I thought I'll sit in the reception area, look through my notes, and do some last-minute prep. I entered the building and introduced myself to the two gossiping receptionists sitting behind the desk. They looked at the clock. You're really early, said one. Oh, well, I know, uh, but I don't mind sitting here. I'll look through my notes. And they glanced at each other and I sat down on the chair feeling unwelcome. A couple of minutes passed. I opened my folder, started reading. You sure you don't want to go out for a walk or something? Says, one of the, says the other receptionist. No, I'm fine, thanks, I said and carried on. Another 30 seconds passed. That's all. It's a long time to wait, <laughs> said the first. I'm there basically yes. chucking me out. <laughs> yeah. I really think you should go into the village. I started to get annoyed. I'm fine, really, thanks, I replied. This was starting to get awkward. When she mentioned it a third time, I began to get paranoid, decided to go for a walk after all. I didn't want to annoy the company before I'd even set foot in the door. So I gathered my belongings and went outside. It was a warm, dry day, and I had no idea where to go. I had no interest in the few shops the village had, so I just kept walking. After a while, I noticed that one of the pop socks I was wearing had a ladder in it. So I found a bench in a nearby park, sat down and removed them. As I did so, a small man in his 40s came running over to me, pointing and said the words that still haunt me today. I've just painted that seat! Oh, no! <laughs> I froze. I didn't move for what seemed oh, like forever, no. and I just stared at him wide-eyed. Then slowly I stood up and peeled myself oh, no. from the bench. I could hear my suit separating from the freshly painted bench with a slurp. I looked round and saw that the entire back of my once black suit was now bright green. And then all hell broke loose. OMG, I yelled. Not no, that we did didn't. that in 2002. No. There's no sign to say it's been painted. I've got an interview in 40 minutes. What am I supposed to do now? I'm screaming. The man looked worried. He thought for a few seconds and then said... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he's going to say? Well, I've got some black paint. Okay. <laughs> no, he's even stranger. He said, well, my wife's about your size. I'm sure she might have something you could Aww. fit. <laughs> right. I just stared at him. I couldn't quite believe what was happening. And then he said, stay here. I'll be back in a minute. And he disappeared. A few minutes later, he came rushing back with another man of a similar age. What? <laughs> this man lives nearer. He said... <laughs> His daughter's about your size. She'll have something you can wear. No way. Well, Simon, I had two choices. In the absence of any shops where I could purchase an emergency outfit, I could either go back to the interview covered in bright green paint, or I could risk going back to this man's house in the hope of finding something in his daughter's wardrobe. <laughs> I chose the latter. So, uh... What? So she's going. So she's going to she's this... going back to this guy's okay. house. Okay. Right. Okay. So what do you do in the park? I asked. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, let's make conversation now, yeah, yeah. Uh, I walk around it, he says, looking a bit confused. Brilliant, I thought. He didn't even work in the park. He's just some random bloke who happened to be walking there. We arrive at his house about five minutes later. Mary, he calls in as we walk through the door. I've got a young lady here who's got an interview in 20 minutes. She's got paint on her clothes. She needs something to wear. Could you find something of Stacey's? A small round woman with curly brown hair appears from the kitchen. She led me upstairs without question, as though this was a regular <laughs> this occurrence. This all the time. <laughs> yeah. The bedroom yeah. was a tip with clothes <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> We've all got one of those. Mary starts pulling things out of the wardrobe and off the floor, <laughs> trying to find something suitable. She hasn't really got anything smart, no. she says. Oh, She's just pulled a pair of grey leggings out of the wardrobe. <laughs> I surveyed the room, a renewed sense of dread washing over me. Um, how old is your daughter? I asked hesitantly. Twelve? Twelve! <laughs> replied oh, Mary. She's twelve! Shaking her head at a small cropped top in a drawer. <laughs> Will this do? No, it's a cropped top. I felt like I was in a nightmare I couldn't get out of. be Royston Vase, you can't. I couldn't for the life of me think how this scenario was going to end. Finally, Mary found a stretchy pair of black trousers, which were lurking in a screwed-up ball under the bed. I tried them on, and miraculously they fitted, even if they didn't go with my smart jacket. I thanked Mary and ran back to the office. I was nearly hysterical by the time I burst into reception. I can't believe what's just happened! I blurted out to the receptionist, and I told them the entire story. And as they were laughing at my misfortune, the interviewer walked through the door and said, You're not here to have fun, you know. Shall we go up? Anyway, I followed the interviewer up to the meeting room where another man was also sitting and I proceeded to tell them both the story of how I came to be wearing mismatched clothes because I didn't want them to think this is how I usually dressed. Sadly, I think my fate was already sealed. Having had such a surreal experience and no chance to quietly compose myself, the two-hour interview process was a total shambles and unsurprisingly, I didn't get the job. So, Father Simon, I seek, to, I seek forgiveness from the man in the park and his family who tried to help me. I did later return the trousers by post. And also from the interviewers for completely wasting their time with a shambolic interview. A few weeks later, I did manage a successful interview, passed my driving test, and have managed 15 years without any more paint-related mishaps and going to men's houses <laughs> to try on their daughter's clothes. Twelve. What a bizarre... Yeah, I mean, 12. Tw she's 12. Oh, she's 12. Oh, right. The guy I'm not 12. <laughs> the guy hadn't quite worked out what the problem was there. Uh, anyway, what a, an extraordinary incident here uh, from Sarah. Bobby, what do you, what do you say? I thought she was going to say, just bring, give me some school uniform and I'll wear that instead. Um, I, I love, what a lovely story. What a lovely park keeper. I know he should have put the sign up and he started all this, but at least he went, OK, what can I do to fix it? And found someone else and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I didn't like the receptionist. I thought they weren't very nice and they could have it's made kind a of cup their of tea. Fault. It is kind of well, their fault. Yeah, it is. Why didn't they just say, yeah, have a cup of tea? Is there anything we can help you with? That's what kind of, I don't know. I, I say what most normal people would do but there I, I think you're right i think everybody is forgiven and let's face it it wasn't a job you needed you got another one so everything's all right everything came out in the wash except for the paint very good oh, very you're Matthew, forgiven. Yes. this is like the kind of nightmare that you have before the interview isn't it where you think like going in there naked or going in there and not being able to answer <laughs> any of the questions or anything like it, this is just unbelievable she found herself in a stranger's daughter's yes, bedroom it's just trying on 12 year old tw clothes 20 minutes to go and I'm not, why am I in this house? A crop top. What? I don't know what's going on. Uh, it's, it's, it's superb. And, and also, it's the paper's loss. What a great story this would have been. Could have had this in your newspaper. And what are you doing a two-hour interview? For? Who does a two-hour interview? <laughs> if you don't know after ten minutes, you're not hiring them. There must two have been, hours? there must be like a paper Ridiculous. or something. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, so I am going to say forgiven. Father Simon, both fantastic and forgiving, the beautiful, benevolent Bobby, and magnificent and masterful. Well Matt. done. Yes, right. forgiven. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Goodbye. My confession dates back to that wonderful time in any couple's lifetime when your first child is due, and you still live in that utopian world of a social life, the ability to do what you want, when you want, and relative freedom. The build-up to our first child had actually... It's a relatively easy pregnancy, really. We visited the planned hospital and its maternity ward. We joined the NCT groups and immersed ourselves in planning and readying nurseries and buying all the paraphernalia that comes with those darling little ones. However, this whole process gave huge fuel to my aforementioned husband to make all sorts of unnecessary comments and jokes at my expense. For example, 
Do I have to attend the birth? It would be much better if you could leave it to the experts. I could go and play golf. Okay. He is sounding <laughs> a real catch. Yep. Or, I'm worried your waters are going to break in the car on the way to the hospital. Would you mind sitting in the boot? <laughs> really? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I, he's... I think he's joking. I think he's joshing. Oh, yes. It? Yeah. It's, it's still... Obviously. Clearly, he thinks that's hugely <laughs> entertaining. <laughs> Whilst made in jest, says M, all these comments began to grate, and it wasn't long before a wicked revenge scheme started to form. And the more comments my husband made, the more my masterful scheme seemed all the more acceptable, in my mind at least. You would have thought after years of partnership, he should have learnt that a woman crossed is a force of nature. Eventually the day of truth arrived after what felt like an eternity of expanding tummy, exhaustion, sleepless nights and scheming. As it happened, we had family over and enjoyed a lovely evening of catching up over a birth-inducing curry. This is a kind of a, a well-known thing. This is what people do. Husband was on strict instructions not to drink in case he was needed later for driving me to the hospital and we all discussed the pending arrival with great excitement. But as we were still three days away from my due date, I stupidly thought that as this was my first, it was likely to be late, if anything. We eventually retired to bed at a relatively late for us 10.30pm and although I had been feeling a little peculiar and stomach fluttering most of the day, I thought little of it as I drifted off to sleep. At midnight, I woke to severe stomach pains, which I initially thought might be the curry, but after several contractions, I woke my husband and barked at him to contact the hospital. The contractions built incredibly quickly, and within an hour, we were on our way to the maternity ward, my hubby a little less full of his japes as we made the 15-minute journey in. This is probably brought on by tiredness, but also this sudden dawning that he would have to grow up and be a <laughs> responsible parent at last. Although he did slip in a comment along the lines of typical you couldn't have waited until the morning to go into labor could you <laughs> be <lying> me <sighs> now without wanting to spoil the birthing process for any listeners who may be due to go through this themselves says em i didn't personally enjoy child labor that much really, really? i mean child labor actually <laughs> that's, that's something that's, else that isn't means it? <laughs> when when you employ a child for no money but anyway i think what em means is the whole process of labor in general and giving birth I didn't really enjoy it. Through the pain, I had also weirdly transformed into Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> and mid-contraction and hug with my husband, I actually bit down on his right ear Ooh. and had left significant bite marks. However, this is not what I need to confess about, though. Well, it's not a bad start. Worse than that. You see, in the whole planning process of the birth, Hubby and I had discussed cutting the umbilical cord, a magical moment where a father separates child from its mother to go out into the world unplugged, so to speak. Well, at least, it should be. Because after eight hours of labour, and after the inevitable cheap jibes that neither myself or the attending midwives found funny, the scene was finally set for my cunning plan against my husband. Scissors in hand, and poised like a royal about to open a museum wing. <laughs> my darling husband stands over me with a wonderful mixture of pain anxiety and concern across his face. He leans forward and starts to cut, but just as he does so, I muster all the remaining strength inside me and shout as loudly as I can, Ow! Oh, 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 no! No! I can still picture the look of absolute despair and dread as my husband panics, looking up from his scissor work to the midwives for an explanation. What has he done? What have I done? That's not supposed to happen. The midwives looked at each other, then across to me, and could see the broad grin painted across my now laughing face <laughs> as my revengeful deed had been done. Got you, <laughs> I exclaimed as husband dropped the scissors and nearly started to cry again. <laughs> to be honest, I don't really seek forgiveness for my husband who had it coming to him. I have dined out on this story ever since, and I have to say the midwives also thought it was hilarious. It did somewhat frustrate me that when we had our second child, I couldn't play this joke on my husband again. Well, he may be daft, but I think he's not that daft. I do, however, seek forgiveness for any other expectant mums who were in earshot 
that morning for concerning themselves over the shenanigans going on in the cubal next to theirs. Uh, it really doesn't hurt that much. Uh, anyway, I'm just amazed that M had the wherewithal to carry out a plan, having literally <laughs> seconds before yes. given birth to their first child, that she still wanted to stick to the plan and managed to say, got you. I well mean, done. that is yeah. quite extraordinary. Anyway, so well done to him. Let's see what Sister Bobby thinks. Yeah, as you say, <clears throat> what a fantastic couple you are. Because let's face it, you know, when life gets tough, you just throw comedy at it and hopefully that'll get you through. And you must be brilliant parents, I have to say. I think that's a really good story. Because right at the end, you're still taking the mickey out of each other. But and who's I gonna, love that. Who is going to actually go ahead with a practical joke, <laughs> having given birth <laughs> <Yeah>. an <laughs> eight-hour... I love this woman. Oh, my goodness, Inspired, me. inspired, uh, completely forgiven. I just think it's one of my favourite stories ever. Force of oh, nature well is absolutely right, brother Matthew. Yeah, I mean, if you dish it out, you've got to take it, haven't you? I, I'm, I have to say, when I had to cut the cord... I. It didn't feel like a magical moment. It felt like, I just want to get this right. Tell me exactly what I need to do. I've only been in charge of the gas and air and <laughs> encouraging my wife and saying, just listen to the staff. They seem to know what they're doing. I don't. Um, am I cutting this in the right place? Oh. Um, and she didn't so think to go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> she no. had been on the floor. Uh, so, yeah, obviously. Adjudicators of absolution. I wish to confess to something that happened a number of summers ago and which has weighed heavily upon my conscience ever since. My story begins, hopefully enough, with young love. Boy and girl meet at a friend's party. The year is turning to summer. There are fairs with waltzes and the winning of cuddly toys. Romance blooms in all of its enthusiasm and energy. Winter follows autumn, with ice skating hand in hand on the ice rink in the town square rubbing noses together to warm them and supping mulled wine at Christmas markets. Another summer comes and the couple celebrate their first anniversary. Families are met. A second year passes, with their relationship maturing with the seasons. We skip to their third summer, taking a romantic stroll in a charming village. As they pass a picturesque flint stone and red brick church that our girl has always admired, our boy drops to one knee and proposes. He is nervous, stutters a little over his words, reads her a little of her favourite poem as he describes his love for her, his appreciation of her love for him, that it would make him the happiest man in the world to be able to love her for the rest of their days. We know all of this because we were there, and I'm not using the royal we. You see, behind the privet hedge that separated the church grounds from the footpath, crouching down, and holding our breaths so that we would neither be seen or heard were all of his friends. More than that, as her parents and all of her family were there, and his parents and all of his family, and the vicar. Behind wow. the hedge! The boy had, and with the full cooperation of the girl's friends and family, organized an entire wedding wow. in absolute secrecy. The church was booked. The rings bought, flowers arranged, the reception catered, the honeymoon paid for, everything. Her best friends were dressed in their bridesmaid outfits with delicate gold brocade. A wedding dress, pearl white, decorated tastefully with teal and gold embroidery, and suit, black, teal waistcoat with gold embroidery, gold handkerchief and cummerbund were ready for them to change into. Matt's got his head in his hands. Oh, no. I, yeah, go on. We were all there, yeah. waiting in hiding, ready to leap out and cheer as she said, no. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> I don't, oh, no. One of the bridesmaids, too far away to hear the actual response, but close enough to hear that one had been made, went to leap up. She was quickly restrained by another bridesmaid and her cheer indignantly muffled behind a hand. We were all shocked, not knowing what to do looking nervously amongst each other, still bent double and becoming more and more stiff. The vicar's face was a picture of utter clerical dismay. <laughs> I like that phrase, yeah, uh, clerical a dismay <laughs> looks yeah, like. Yeah, I've seen them live. A bell ringer's face, having received no signal, peered inquiringly out at us from the church doors. Somebody broke wind. We presume <gasps> it was nerves. Obviously. It's a slightly, yes, I slight mean, detour. Yeah, there. we have come. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually... After much communication solely through looks, the parents of our boy and our girl made their presence known, exiting the church gate, each pair escorting their child off 
in opposite directions. I said before that we were all shocked and I sincerely wish that I could honestly apply that to myself. However, that is not the case and so thereby I need to seek forgiveness. You see, the party at which they had met was one of my own. I was equally friends with each of them and I had more and more suspected that although for him the romance had blossomed into love, for her it had merely faded away. I suspect that he may have intimated the same and that this was actually his last gasp gamble. You cannot hope on hope alone no matter how hopeful our beginning. I repeatedly urged him to be cautious but to no avail. But I wish now that I had been more forthright with my misgivings and had not wanted to be interfering and so it is this that I request forgiveness for that though I could have not prevented heartbreak, if I had been much more forceful in trying to dissuade my friend, I could have at least saved him so much humiliation. Okay. That's the end of part one. There's then an epilogue. <laughs> really? There's more? Wow. Go it's on. like a Richard Curtis it movie is, here. The epilogue. The vicar dismissed the choir and generously returned the fee. The rest of us went to the reception. The food would other, otherwise have been wasted. It was a strange event. No. Equal parts of mirth and shock, much gossiping was made. We divided the bill for the event equally amongst all who attended. I bought the honeymoon from our boy and enjoyed the company of the maid of honour. Right. Okay. Oh, there yeah. was much consummation and consumption of food oh, and wine. really didn't need to get into that. We both thoroughly enjoyed role-playing the parts of oh. our new Mr. and Mrs. at the hotels and on the cruise. Bet you did. All of the financial rearrangements and reimbursements were naturally organised post-fact due to time constraints. Our girl wished to remain friends with our boy, don't they always, but that never works out and indeed didn't in this case. She spent some time travelling the world and has since married happily. He has remained staunchly unmarried, though has a long-term serious and exceedingly patient girlfriend who is quite unabashedly unsubtle about the fact that she would marry him now, right now, if not more quickly, <laughs> and child. Yours, the third of two. Well, you wow. know, I said it was a slightly unusual tale. Yeah. Beautifully written, third of two. Thank you very much. I mean, for a moment, we were behind that wall with you, waiting and suspecting that things weren't going yeah. to go terribly. But how extraordinary to book friends, family, the vicar, pay for the honeymoon, pay for the food, and have it all there ready to go. And the answer was no, Sister Bobby. Well, to, I mean, it, was, it wasn't inevitable, but who does that? Well, what? You just don't do that. because Too You keen. don't do that. Well, you just don't do that, because first of all, you're not including her in that bit. No, even if she said yes, you're still basically excluding her from all that planning and everything. So that's the first one. You don't do that. That's too much of a risk. Even if they say yes, you don't do that. Have you not seen Don't Tell the Bride? That's what that's about. That what? Okay. Years and years of Don't Tell the Bride going, don't do that, even if you save money. Uh, the first thing is, though, should you be forgiven? Absolutely, for not being uh, more forceful with your friend. The thing is, you said please be cautious please be cautious please don't do this please don't do this please don't do this if you had made him not do it you could have been responsible for so much more so you weren't responsible for this I mean he was he was responsible for his own decision you said be cautious that's as much as you could do otherwise and so you're forgiven forgiven so I wanted, uh, there must be people listening who remember this wedding. It's not the kind of the old non-wedding. Oh, it's not the kind me. of thing that you're going to no. uh, forget. Anyway, Brother Matthew. Well, yes, I mean, here's the thing. If you're going to do that, if you're going to propose and have everything set up ready to go, you need to be absolutely 100% sure she's going to say yes. <coughs> and clearly, this guy not only thought that it might not happen... I suspect that he was thinking, well, she's not going to turn me down when everyone's there. She didn't know, though. She didn't she know didn't they were know, all hiding behind the hedge. He's, I, I think he was probably gambling on the fact that someone would go, oh, but we've all turned up, and she'd change her mind. So I'm going to say definitely... Well, he's forgiven, isn't he? So yes. forgiving the third of two, he's not forgiven for putting her in that position. He's not forgiven. No, 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 the, the guy who's... The, yes, the, the one who knew. Have I got confused? No, 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 third of two, Let's you say forgiven right. and not... Dear Father Simon and the potential providers of penance. Mm. My confession goes back just a couple of years when I was working for a small coach company in the north of England. And as well as coaches, there are also a number of 16-seater minibuses modelled on a rather well-known van. On the day in question, I was driving one of these buses, and having completed all my jobs, I was returning back to the yard. After the usual cleaning duties of sweeping and mopping, 
I collected all my personal possessions from the minibus and took them to my car before going into the office to return the key. However, after rootling around in my pockets, I realised to my alarm that I didn't have the bus key. So frig, I must, figuring I must have left it in the car, I went back to my car to retrieve it. I looked to the passenger seat where I'd left my coat in my wallet and inside my lunchbox, but no joy. I widened my search out to the rest of the car and still the keys were nowhere to be found. Not full panic time yet though, maybe I'd left them in the bus. I went back to the bus, peered through the window and alas, there it was in the ignition. I pulled the handle to open the door, but it was locked. This doesn't happen quite so much, but it used to be quite a standard thing that you'd, you'd lock your own keys into the, and in this case, locked in the ignition. I went back to the office and explained that somehow the bus had locked itself and the keys were inside, <laughs> yeah. but explained that I was completely stumped as to how this could have occurred. No idea. Not to worry, though, I was told, the office has a spare key cupboard for just this occasion. But after looking through key after key in said cupboard, it became apparent this was the only vehicle that we didn't actually have a spare for. One of the mechanics, we'll call him John, had a look round and from the outside managed to slide one of the windows in the back open before realising this was not going to work as nobody would be able to lean through and unlock it. John then had a realisation. One of our other mechanics, let's call him Nobby, was quite a slender guy and might just fit through the gap. John has created the, this gap that John has created in the back window. There's no comma there. Mm. Neil was sent for, uh, Nobby was sent for, and after much protestation, finally agreed to give it a go. Gosh, this is very slim, isn't he, Nobby? John and I lifted Nobby and proceeded to push him, push him through this open window. This was going quite well and actually seemed like it would succeed until Nobby got stuck mm. with just his legs hanging out of the bus. He was well and truly stuck. He couldn't move forwards or backwards and was perfectly balanced betwixt inside and outside, unable to move at all. Nobby found it slightly funny at first and then considerably less funny yeah. as the minutes ticked away. Can't you stretch just a little bit more? Someone shouted, but Nobby couldn't hear. Can't you... Can't you stretch... <laughs> Someone found a loud hailer. Yeah, they had, clearly. Yeah. And they joined in. He could hear it this time. <laughs> I'm a mechanic, not a blooming contortionist, was the gist of what Nobby said. Yeah. Back to us, as you can imagine. The solution lay in the end. Maybe half an hour later, we found out in spraying his hips with WD-40. Oh, my goodness. Mm. I, I wouldn't have thought of that. No, but Nobby didn't either. But with a bit of wiggling of his hips, normally only seen on the Strictly dance floor, Nobby managed to get enough stretch to just about reach over and pull the handle to the sliding door with the tips of his fingers. Finally, we opened the door, and after much pulling, we managed to free the much lubricated Nobby, who fell onto the floor with quite a thud. The keys were retrieved, and the bus was locked. To this day, it remains a mystery how the bus managed to lock itself with a key in the ignition. That is, I have to say... Except to me, says Alex. You see, I know exactly what happened. My mum has a car made by the same company, with the same kind of key for which I had the spare. And it transpires that with the older models, you can use any key from that manufacturer to lock the door, but not to unlock it. I had got out of the bus to put things in my car and proceeded to lock the bus with my mum's car key. Therefore, clearly, I seek forgiveness, obviously not from John who, like me, thought it was hilarious, but from Nobby, who ended up with several bruises, greased hips, and a ripped pair of jeans. It was pretty funny, though, uh, at the time, says Alex. Well, Alex is fine, and John wow. is fine. Wow. Nobby had to uh, suffer mm. for having uh, slim hips. What do you say, Sister Bobby? Can I just clear one fact? Was Nobby naked when he went through the window? <laughs> 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 no. Well, listen, the thing need, is... You need to control your mind. Oh, the reason oh, yeah. why is you, they said they, you know, WD-40'd him. Hips. Well, if he had his trousers on, if those had been removed slightly, I that would give some type of leverage. I think the T-shirt might have written up the, just a little bit. So it was above the tra waistline, you know, and, yeah? And that bit is going to be... The, That's the Bony then. hips is going to stick out, but was, if you grease them well, up... You see, the thing is, because if shoulders go through, your hips should go... So I thought he was stuck at the hips, not the waist, because the hips are generally Basically, bigger. Basically, it's the hips, shoulders, knees and toes, <laughs> knees and toes. <laughs> OK, so Nobby wasn't naked. That's a relief. Yeah. And so, Simon, could you do your belt up? Uh, uh, well, you've just done this belt, Nobby. No, Nobby was clothed. As far as we know, Nobby was fully clothed, because he got 
ripped jeans out. Alex, of. I've done a similar thing and got myself locked out and had to call the police when I had the wrong key in the front door and it wouldn't work and it was just the wrong key. So I've been equally daft. Uh, so, and also, I kind of like this. I like the fact you all got together, you know, three mechanics and a drug bus driver and you all fixed it and everything was okay in the end. Nothing got smashed, nothing got broken. A bit of WD-40 fixes most things. Novice. Well, there you go. It takes a bit of locking a car, set of keys into a car when you have to lift, lock it from the inside being on the door. Believe me, <laughs> uh, it took me quite a while to get out of that one. But slender, lubricated knobby. I thought he might have been beginning to swell up after a while. I think that's where it was going with this one, which is what happens. No, he, um, he, he, was, stu he was stuck for a while. He was indeed. And yeah. his trousers were absolutely covered in WD-40. So they had to make a mess. So I hope someone cleaned those for him. Yeah. Uh, and Alex, you know, I don't think anyone really believed it wasn't you who made a Horlix of it. Uh, so other drinking products are available. Um, so I'm going to forgive you completely. All right. Yeah. Matthew. Yes, we're definitely in 70s sitcom land again, aren't we? And all the better for it, I would say. I had no idea that WD-40 worked on, on skin or, or indeed clothing. I we're, thought it was just Can metal. I just say at this point, we're not saying that this is a good idea. No, obviously or not. Or that you try this at home. And I'm sure there's other lubricants uh, it's available not what it's there as well for. that you can spray on people uh, to get them through windows. I'm not sure um, that there are. I don't think there are. Butter, um, maybe. Butter, yes. No, but, but, oil. Vegetable oil will be good. Ve vegetable, vegetable oil. Would we'll be right, and, and yeah, that would be perfect. What about ground nut oil? Would that well, also well, work? Yeah, sunflower yeah. is cheapest, so that would be virgin better. olive oil. No, um, no, no, lots, of, lots of different oils uh, available. Um, uh, so I'm going to forgive because you know it was fun, and you know, Nobby. I mean, he gets get through life, he's got the slim hips, everything else is working <laughs> for him, and it just turns out in this situation, slim hips worked against him. Unlucky.